Hi, um, my name is Dr. Peter Kay, and um, this module is the heat transfer um, power and environment. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about uh, the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, so by the end of this lecture, you, this is what um, you should be able to do. So, you should be able to describe the operation of heat engines and heat pumps. Okay. Understand the Kelvin Planck and Clausius statements, and as we come to see, these two statements from um, uh, these scientists form the basis for the second law of thermodynamics. Um, you should also understand the concept of the Carnot cycle and apply it to practical systems. As we see, this uh, cycle is very important in terms of um, uh, mechanical engineering and power cycles, and also sets the uh, theoretical limits. Um, for the efficiencies of these um, cycles as well. And also, lastly, um, define entropy, state its SI units, and discuss the importance of this property. And as we come to see, this um, property has some quite uh, profound um, uh, implications. Okay, so first, I um, just want to ask you this question. So, why can't we um, heat, why can't heat from the atmosphere be used to boil a kettle? So if we think about the kettle over here in the room, why can't we just absorb heat uh, from the atmosphere and get the um, water to boil um, instantaneously or by itself? So as long as the, um, the amount of heat that we're removing from the atmosphere is the same um, as the amount of heat that we're applying to the kettle, then the, for the first law is conserved. So there's nothing in the first law of thermodynamics that says this can't take place. As long as the um, the the net change in heat here is equal to the net drop here is equal to the net heat increase here, there's nothing to stop this from happening. But of course, we know that this can't happen. Okay, and energy has to happen in a certain direction. And the first law, as I said, places no restrictions on this um, direction. But the second law addresses this, and this is what we're going to be talking about today. So the violation is um, detected. So, in other words, this can't fail. We have a property called entropy, and we're we're um, come to that towards the end of the lecture. So, a process um, can't occur unless it satisfies both the first and the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, and the first law is you can think of it just being concerned with the uh, quantity of uh, heat. So, as I say, you know, as long as you got the same net change all the way around, that's fine. Um, the second law is concerned with quality, in other words, sort of direction, and it also sets some theoretical limits of systems. Okay, so before we start to go on and analyse um, some of these thermodynamic cycles, we need to um, uh, uh, discuss some um, terminology. And we, in thermodynamics, we talk about thermal energy reservoirs and heat fl flowing from one reservoir to another. Okay, and a thermal energy reservoir um, is a body that can absorb or supply la large quantities of heat isothermally. So, for example, oceans, uh, the atmosphere, a furnace. And just to give you an example, so if I take the ocean uh, um, as an example, if you think when you go swimming in the ocean, um, you're giving out heat, your body's generating heat and that's given out. Now you get cold when you swim in the sea because the ocean is absorbing the heat from from your body, but there's no appreciable change in the temperature of the ocean, so it's absorbing that heat isothermally because it's such a large body of um, water. So that's what we mean um, when it's supplying or uh, absorbing heat um, isothermally. Now obviously the ocean's large and the atmosphere's large, but the size of the the body itself doesn't have to be large, just as long as it's the size of the body is large relative to the system. So, for example, if you were doing the um, a heat uh, analysis on um, a piece of electrical equipment, so say the television in your living room, you could treat the atmosphere uh, in the living room um, as a thermal energy reservoir uh, or sink. Um, because although the room living room isn't large, it's large in comparison to the system, the television which you're analysing. So reservoirs that supply heat are called sources, okay? And obviously uh, furnaces are a good example of this. And reservoirs that absorb heat are called sinks, and the atmosphere 
and the ocean are good examples of those. Okay, so we're first going to talk about heat engines before we talk about heat pumps, um, mainly because these are the main source of power uh, in our um, society. Okay, and heat engines can vary considerably, but they're generally characterised by these uh, four um, points here. Firstly, they receive uh, heat from a high temperature source. Okay, and the heat that it absorbs, we're going to call obviously Q for heat. It's H for the high temperature. Okay, it converts part of it to work, and obviously there's a number of ways it can do that depending on the technology there but it converts part of it to work. And the rest of the heat, it rejects to a sink, and we're gonna call that QL, Q to the low temperature sink, okay? And this is one of the main things, it operates on a cycle, so there'll be a working fluid inside whatever technology this is, and um, that's operating on a cycle. So those are the four main points, and although these are kind of the things you need for it to be considered a heat engine, in practice, we talk about heat engine in a broader sense. So, for example, an internal combustion engine doesn't operate in a cycle. It operates on a therm thermodynamic cycle, but it doesn't. The air um, that's inducted and then combusted isn't used in the next cycle. It's expelled from the engine, and a new charge is brought in. So, strictly speaking, it's not well. It's not work operating on a cycle, but because of some approximations we can make, we do approximate it to working on a cycle and therefore classify it as a heat engine. The thermal efficiency um, of a heat engine is, um, well, the thermal efficiency of anything really, is the desired output, so in this case is um, the network, over the required input. And the required input in this case is QH, so it's is normally the network done, which is normally what you want to get out um, from a heat engine, over the required input, okay? So we can write that for this system, so our desired output is W net as I say, and required input is QH. And, but we can remember from the first law that if the um, net, because uh, it's operating on a cycle, the net um, change in internal energy in this system is zero, so therefore from the first law, the net uh, work that's created is equal to the net heat, or QH minus QL. We can plug that equation into the thermal efficiency equation, and we get um, the thermal efficiency as a function of the heats. And if we rearrange, we can um, distill it down to this formula here. So you can clearly see that um, the thermal efficiency is 1 minus QL over QH. So the smaller this term, the greater your efficiency will be. So the, the more you can increase QH by, the smaller this term will be, the more the higher efficiency. Okay, so that's what we're trying to get to. So the, talked about heat engines operating on a cycle. Um, and this is probably um, the classic example. Um, and this is how we generate um, the majority of our uh, electricity. And this truly does work on a cycle. So if we start at the top, we have a boiler. Um, so water here is the um, working fluid in this heat engine. So we start off with a boiler. We supply some heat to it. That um, then obviously converts the water into steam, um, normally superheated steam. That steam then comes is passed through a steam turbine where we obviously extract some work from the turbine and use that work to turn a generator to produce electricity. The uh, low temperature steam is then either partly condensed into water or um, is on its way um, to condensing. Pass it through a condenser, remove some heat from the system, okay, and um, uh, that then goes into a pump. We put in a small bit of work here or some large amount of work depending on the um, system that we're talking about. Put some work into the system to pump it back up into the boiler and around we go. So you can see that this truly is operating on a cycle. So if we think of that in terms of a heat engine, it fits our nice uh, defined um, definition that we uh, that I showed you on a, a couple of slides ago. So we're supplying heat, we're doing some network, we're rejecting some heat, and this is operating on a nice cycle. 
So on the previous slide, I showed you that um, we have the condenser to um, take the heat out of the steam to condense it from the steam um, back into the water. So why can't we keep the heat, the energy that's been rejected? It seems an awful uh, waste of um, uh, heat just to be rejecting it each time. And this kind of forms one of the um, statements of the uh, second law of thermodynamics. And um, I use an example to show why we can't keep the energy that's been rejected. So if we consider this follow example. So in this um, piston we have a gas at low temperature and we have an energy source at a much higher temperature and we're supplying the gas with some heat. Okay, And on top of the the, the, ga the gas is trapped by a piston and on top of that piston there's a mass. Okay, So as we heat this um, gas, the gas heats up and if we take that energy source away, the, the gas heats up and as it heats up it does some work and it lifts the, the mass up to the top of the piston. Now, if we want to keep the energy that we've rejected, then if we want to reuse the um, if we want to reuse the energy that we've rejected, then we have to put it back into the same reservoir that we used to heat the gas in the first place. Okay, so we'd if we want to keep the heat, we'd put it in, heat it up. We'd have to put it back to the same reservoir to then put it back in and go around again. But you can now clearly see that this can't happen. So we've taken the mass off. There's no way that um, heat will flow from twenty five. Um, degrees C into an energy source at 100 degrees C if we want to get our gas back to its original state which we do for it to operate on a cycle. <clears throat> so this just can't happen. So the only way that we can get our um, working fluid back to its original state is to reject the heat to a low temperature source so we return it back to its original state so we can start the cycle over again. Okay. So this is why we can't keep the energy that's been rejected. Okay.